join me in the book of Exodus chapter 20. If you brought your Bibles with you this morning, we're reading the 17th verse, the 10th and final word that God spoke from Mount Sinai to his people and to us. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 20 verse 17. As you're turning there, um, I was walking in this morning and I saw where Victory Ridge had placed a poster in the back that said, it does not matter how slowly you go as long as you do not stop. And my thought was, whoever wrote that poster has not been trying to move into a new church building. And uh, seems like it's going slowly, doesn't it? But I do want to encourage you, we are moving that direction. And I hope that you'll come out on the 22nd of September for our Worship Wednesday. The general contractor for our building will be here. And so we'll worship together and then we'll have a time where you can ask questions and we'll try and bring you up to date on how things are going there. <coughs> Also, it's been kind of a, for I'm, I'm sure for a lot of you, a difficult week, an interesting month, and there are a few things that before we get into the Word, I'd like to mention so that we can be praying about them. So many things that are happening in our world that I think the church, God's people need to be aware of. Let's not forget that the people in Cuba still want their freedom, and uh, they're receiving little notice and very, very little help in their uh, striving that way and also the island of Haiti um, the earthquakes and the hurricane and uh, really no capacity to deal with that and that's the result of decades of poor leadership and so there are innocent people that are suffering on that island and our lives continue to be disrupted daily by COVID I think it's a situation that is made worse by the naive belief that we've placed in our human intelligence to be able to end things like this I have found out that human beings can create catastrophes. We don't solve them very well. And um, we had a young man named Kevin who passed away. Many of you know him. Uh, Kevin's uh, funeral is this coming Tuesday at Impact Church. The viewing is, um, begins at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and just the funeral's at 3 if you're interested in that information. But let's be praying for him and his family. And then this past week, 13 of our service people were killed, murdered really, trying to serve and help folks who desperately want to leave Afghanistan, trying really hard to get to, the, to this oppressive country that we call the USA, trying really hard to get here. And 13 of the people who serve us were murdered this last week, and uh, we need to pray. Uh, it breaks my heart that folks who went there, and I don't know any of them personally, but I know they were there serving us. And they did it from some sense of conviction that I admire in them, and they deserve our support, and their families deserve our prayers. So will you pray with me for a moment as we begin? Father, you are the God of all nations. Your word says that you hold the nations in your hands. And just like Pastor Mike re uh, reminded us that the, the nations rage and the heathen mutter, but when you lift your voice, you take control of every situation. It's not our business to tell you what to do, but you told us to ask for things, and I'm asking that you would begin to speak and act again into the situations of our, of our world that desperately need you. You've heard the things that we've mentioned this morning, Lord, and we live in your blessing, Father. You just keep opening the windows of heaven and pouring out on us. We've got nothing to complain about, but we're concerned for our country. We ask God also for the country of Cuba and Haiti and Afghanistan and people who don't live under the blessings that you've shown our country, blessings that we have taken so much for granted. Forgive us, Lord, when we badmouth your goodness. We pray for families who are suffering, for educators who are trying to do their job in a situation that really nobody knows what to do about. So they're just trying to do their best, and they get criticized from every direction. Give them the strength they need and the grace that comes only from you to do their job well. And we pray for the families of those who lost loved ones who were serving us in the nation of Afghanistan this week. Pray, God, that you would give, give them comfort. And then we ask, Lord, that you would take control of the minds and the decisions of those people who make choices that affect folks who are serving us. That your wisdom might override man's foolishness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Gen or Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. 
And in case you didn't get it, he just keeps getting more detailed. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant or his ox or his donkey. Or, and he could just keep going, so God just summarizes, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. McDonald's sold its first Happy Meal in 1979. Since then, there have been 1.2 billion Happy Meals sold worldwide. That's an average of three Happy Meals are sold in, in our world every second. Three Happy Meals per second. I don't think the Happy Meal is working. One of my favorite pastors said that he was driving through, going through the McDonald's drive-thru. He had two, his two little girls in the back seat, and, and his oldest wanted the Happy Meal. She knew, uh, she knew that if she got the Happy Meal, that, that her father would not just be buying her McNuggets and a dinosaur stamp. He would be buying her happiness. She had a McVacuum in her soul. Her heart was restless until it found its rest in the Happy Meal. And so she explained, Daddy, if I get a Happy Meal, I'll never ask you for anything again. And he said, this seemed like a good bargain. And so he bought her the Happy Meal. And guess what? After he bought her the Happy Meal, she grew up to become a contented, grateful young lady who never complained again for the rest of her life. You know better, don't you? Less than 20 seconds after she had gotten her Happy Meal and ripped the box open, she was fighting with her sister because she wanted her sister's dinosaur stamp. And so we found out that happiness doesn't come in a box even if McDonald's does it for us. I bring you back to the 10 words. This is the final word in God's 10 words to the nation of Israel and to us. We've been in this all summer, and we've been learning that God is sharing commitments and actions that we have to take to enjoy our relationship with Him and our relationships with one another. In fact, that's the way the commands are broken up. Most scholars will tell you two tables. The first four deal in the vertical with our relationship with God, and the next six in the horizontal, our relationships to one another. And Jesus seemed to understand it that way. He broke the law down into two commands. Love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, your neighbor, and your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. Now, we've also learned that these words were not concerned solely with our personal lives, with our personal morality. God spoke these words to the entire nation of Israel because he was also trying to show them things that have to be in place in order for a society to be blessed, in order for great communities and countries to be built. Blessed nations honor the family. Blessed nations value human life. Blessed nations value and protect traditional marriage. They promote private ownership and responsibility and contribution. And then we learned last week that a blessed nation is committed to justice. Justice the way that God defines it, not whatever term happens to be in vogue in the, in the society today. So that brings us to the final word which we read together this morning. You shall not covet. Now, if you don't think that God has a sense of humor, this week... This week, when I was scheduled, months ago, by the way, to preach on this word, you shall not covet, this week, I had to go to a meeting downtown, and there's a car de detailing business there called Leland's, and right on the corner there, Martin Luther King, Leland's uh, business sets, and right there in his, in his uh, parking lot was something between a 63 and 65 Lincoln Continental, black. It was beautiful, man. It was at least 16 feet long. Suicide doors, curb feelers, custom rims. I, and I, I, had, I drove by it, and, and I haven't stolen it yet. I haven't even tried to buy it. But I have driven by Leland's place six times since then. I have taken friends there just to see that car. I made them look at it and act like they were as excited about it as I am. I have coveted that Lincoln Continental big time. Ask some of my friends. They'll tell you, yeah, Pastor Jack's got it bad. This is what makes this command so unique. It doesn't deal with an action. It deals with a disposition. And after describing actions that we avoid to bless and build community, in this final word, God moves to our hearts. And for that reason, I think this is the most profound and probably the most difficult command for us. And if we don't understand this one, we'll never fulfill all of the rest of them. In fact, I think all of the other nine depend on this one. If my eyes aren't opened by this word, we'll be forever chasing happiness and we will never know peace and contentment in our communities or in our living rooms. So let's explore it together. What's the danger of coveting? And then what is the cure for coveting? 
Here's the danger that's involved in coveting. To covet, thou shalt not covet. To covet means to have a strong desire to possess something. It's a pretty simple explanation. That's all. You haven't actually done anything. You just wanted something or someone. And that makes it so dangerous because, first of all, it's a secret sin. It's a thought process. You do this in your heart and in your mind. I mean, we can see somebody steal... We understand lying if somebody commits that or murder or cheating on their spouse. But we can never see what somebody wants. We can never discern the real desire of somebody's heart. And so this word shows us something. God is very interested in what goes on in our hearts. God is never satisfied with mere outward morality. In fact, one time Jesus said this about the Pharisees who were so particular in their keeping of the law. He said, woe to you teachers of the law, you Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean up the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you're still full of greed, which is just another word for covetousness. You're, you're full of greed and self-indulgence on the inside. Jesus wanted us to understand how committed God is to our hearts and how God isn't after outward conformity. He is in, after the inward cleansing of our spirits and our souls. And it isn't because God is approved. It's because God knows something about our hearts that none of us takes seriously enough, especially now. We don't really take this seriously enough when it comes to our desires. Our desires, our hearts, are corrupted by this persistent coveting. <clears throat> you see, it's, it's human nature to want things, to desire things. I may not know anything about some of you in this room, but I can tell you this, all of you want something. All of you probably have stared over a pop-up ad that came up on your Facebook feed and thought, my life would be so much better if I could have that. All of us want something, and that's normal, and that's natural. One, one author has says, we come into this world longing for things. We are desire, and desire is good, because desire can take us to God. And I think the Bible backs him up on that. The, the book of Proverbs says, the desire of a righteous person can lead to good. The psalmist said, as the deer pants for the brooks of water, so my soul longs after you, O God. So there's a good desire for us to have. Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. That word, that phrase, hunger and thirst, is just another way to say, blessed are you when you desire deeply to be a righteous person, to be a holy person. Paul comes right out and tells the church at Corinth, eagerly desire the king james says covet earnestly the best gifts of the holy spirit and so it's good for us and right for us to desire the gifts of god and the ability to use the gifts of god well in our lives and god has already addressed the natural human desire and right to own things in that command where he told us you shall not steal and we talked about that together so we ought to want things it's good for us to have goals to have dreams you ought to wake up in a morning having something in your life that you want, something that you are pursuing and working towards intensely. I think life would be tedious and dreadful if you didn't have a desire for something. That's not Christianity. Killing your desires is not Christianity. It's stoicism, and it kills your heart. So I'm going to say it again. You ought to want something. You ought to desire good things in your life. You ought to desire to be more holy. You ought to desire to discover and develop your gifts. You ought to want to make a lasting contribution to God's world. You ought to have things in your life that you're coveting earnestly. But the problem is when our desires are misplaced. Misplaced desire. The same author says it this way. The problem is our desires are not hardwired to God. We all get hungry. I mean, hunger is normal and important I'm, hunger is important because it causes us to eat and eating is pretty important wouldn't you say kind of hard to survive if you don't eat occasionally the problem is not the desire not the hunger but how we fulfill that desire i was sitting in the office this past week and hadn't thought about eating it was like mid-afternoon and my stomach reminded me that we hadn't eaten all day and so uh, how did I choose to fulfill that desire? Because we don't have a lot of gourmet cuisine in the office over on Resmondo, but what we do have is a lot of candy bars and potato chips. And so my lunch for that day, my lunch for the day, consisted of a Kit Kat and two small boxes of milk duds and a Mountain Dew. 
that was my lunch for the day. I, I, and, and by the way, I, I have a lot of things when I get hungry that I would like to satisfy my hunger with. I can covet a decent meal or I can covet a whopper. And one whopper is bad enough, but sometimes one whopper leads to two whoppers and then we're completely off the hook, aren't we? The saints used to call this problem that we have inordinate desire, a desire that is poorly focused, focused on the wrong things, and so it's never really satisfied. So a normal and necessary desire can lead to an awful behavior when we focus our cravings on unhealthy things, bad things, or even too much of a good thing can lead us into problems. And God focuses on the first one, the bad thing, with this word. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, your neighbor's wife, your neighbor's servant, your neighbor's ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to them. Wanting a wife or a husband is a good and normal desire. Wanting your neighbor's wife or husband is coveting. Wanting a home is a normal and good desire. Wanting your neighbor's home is coveting. Y'all get this? This is, this is the difference. This is what God is pointing out to us. This one, and, and this is one reason that coveting is so dangerous. Because it works on what is normal and healthy and God-given and twists it into something subtle and sinful and, 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 and destructive to us turns it into lust and greed. And that's a terrible danger because coveting will corrupt us. Again, I want you to look at this. Jesus is in a debate about the law in Matthew chapter 15 with the Pharisees. And, he, and when he finally gets to the point with them, he says this, the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. For out of the heart come evil thoughts. And then he gets into the second table of the Ten Commandments. Murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These, these defile a person. And, and I want you to stop when he says, these things come out of, out of the heart, evil thoughts. That's how the New, New International Version translates it. But the older translations did better. He says, evil desires come out of the heart. Evil desires, lust, and coveting. It comes out of our heart. And after he makes that clear, he lists all of those actions that we've been talking about for the last several weeks, lust and or, um, um, adultery and sexual immorality and theft and lying and false testimony, all of the other commands, all of those actions that we're told that we should avoid, where did they all start? They all originate in our hearts and they all begin with evil desires, with covetousness, with inordinate affection. Jesus says these defile us. They corrupt the way that we look at other people. When we look at, when we look at our neighbor's wife, we don't value our neighbor's wife as a person made in the God's image. We, we, we see them as an object to satisfy lust. We don't see our neighbor as, as someone that we should respect, as someone who, um, who should be valued, as someone created in God's image. All we see them is as someone who has something we want, an obstacle to what we want to make us happy. And when we indulge that selfish, sinful fantasy, it very, very often leads then to um, defiling sinful behavior. Look how Scripture describes this process in James chapter 5. He says, each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own, here it is again, by your own evil desires. Same thing, covetousness. And you're enticed by that. And then after your desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. What a penetrating and fright, frightening description. And what a warning that God is giving us in this passage. James says, you can get to a point where you're being dragged away from what you know is right by your own evil desires that reside in your heart. You, you nurse a fantasy, you indulge a temptation, you play footsie with, with, with some, something in your flesh, and there will come a day when you don't have control of it anymore. It controls you. It will drag you into stuff you know you shouldn't be involved in. Every one of us has had this experience. You're in a moment of decision, <clears throat> your every instinct in you and the Holy Spirit inside of you is screaming at you, no, no, don't do this. And your evil desire, because you've nursed it for oh so long, you've given it so much authority in your life, will grab you and drag you into something. Now, folks, there's a time when temptation flirts, and there's a time when temptation wrestles, and there's a time when temptation attacks. 
And if you mess around with an evil desire too long, it eventually will overpower you. And so you give in to the desire, whether it's for a person that you're not married to, or for a purchase you really can't afford, or for a lie you tell that could get someone else fired so you can be promoted, and you actually do it. You actually do what everything in you tells you you should not do. You commit the sin. Well, when you do that, the Bible says sin starts giving birth to stuff in your life. Sin conceives and gives birth to things. Like, sin will give birth to death in your life. Listen to how James says this. He says, sin, when it is full grown. Now, I want to put this out here for you because some of you got little baby sins that you think are really cute right now. You're cooing over them. Oh, isn't that cute? Isn't that cute? Look. You know what I'm talking about. Some of you got cute little baby sins in your life. And, and right now, they're just harmless little baby-sized sins you think you can keep under control, burping before they go to sleep at night. But here's something I've learned about real babies. They grow up. They get bigger. They move into your bedroom and will not leave your house. Can I get an Amen. You gave birth to that, and it will not leave. Sin has a way of doing that in our lives. It grows up. It eats all your food. <laughs> it takes all your money. It ruins your marriage. Come on, y'all. You know I'm telling you the truth. This is the way... <laughs> This is the way sin grows when it's conceived. It gets bigger. It becomes more demanding. It can't be controlled. It grows up and kill thing, kills things. Adultery kills marriages. Lying kills justice. It kills trust. It kills immediately. And it kills generationally. And by the way, it is residing in every human heart. And one of the reasons that we're struggling so much with leadership in our country today is because we no longer take seriously the idea that every one of us is born a sinner. Every one of us has this wickedness residing in our hearts. It does this, it does this corruption and killing in our personal life, and it corrupts our society. I want to go to James again. In chapter 4, he says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Well, how could they vote for him? That's why I'm mad. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Did you see that on Facebook this week? Really? What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires? Oh, 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 oh. That's where they come from. From your desires that battle within you. You desire, but you don't have. And so you kill. You covet, but you can't get what you want. And so you quarrel and fight. Now, again, I'm trying to emphasize this with every word in, this, in the second tablet of the commands as we've worked our way through it. God isn't just giving us directives for our, our personal lives. He's telling us what is necessary for a nation. And a nation that is blessed will have families that honor parents. They'll honor the right to life. They'll respect the right to private ownership. They'll understand the responsibilities that come with that ownership. And blessed societies pursue justice. But each one of those principles will be violated if we don't deal with our own covetous hearts. You won't have a society with blessing. You'll have a society filled with violence and division. A nation where we justify destroying property because of envy or anger. A nation where we excuse stealing because of lack of opportunities. A nation where we excuse lying because we want certain policies to pass. We know what is best for the people, so we're justified to dispense false information to get to the right destination. We will have a nation where we, where we make murder seem heroic because another life gets in the way of pursuing our future and our dreams. A nation where we understand breaking marriage oaths and walking away from our families because everybody needs to pursue their own happiness. What we want, what we covet, drags us towards death personally and pollutes us as a society, which leads to the greatest danger of having covetousness residing in our hearts it cuts us off from our God. Colossians chapter 3, the apostle says, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and there it is again, evil desires. That's covetous, just evil desires, greed. And by the way, he says, that's idolatry. Greed, lust, covetousness is idolatry. He says it again in Ephesians chapter 5, No immoral, impure, or greedy person. Such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ, and of God. Remember what the first two commandments were? You will have no other gods before me, 
and you will not create an idol anywhere before me. And so he's come all the way back in this 10th commandment to say, anything that you covet that goes against my word is placing an idol up against me. It cuts you off from God. You see, at the root, coveting is idolatry. Coveting is trusting your desires more than your God. Coveting is believing that if you could just have that person or that house or that car, it would make you more happy than having God. And you'll pursue that before him. I want to take you all the way back again. I've been here almost every week, it seems like, in Genesis chapter 3, when the fall begins. Satan finds the woman and her husband in the garden and asks the question, did God really say you should not eat of this fruit? Well, he said we could eat of all the fruit except this one, or we'll die. Ah, you won't really die. He knows that in a day you eat this, you'll become like God, being able to discern the difference between good and evil. And then she just keeps playing around with it, and then look what happens. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and listen to this, and desirable for gaining wisdom. I can get it on my own. This is going to make me happy. When she saw that it was desirable, she took it and ate some of it. She focused on it and started to covet it. This will give me something God can't give me. I can get this without God. I can have this. I can enjoy this if I can just get that fruit. And folks, we do this stuff the same way, the same thing every day in our life. I can have a better, a better marriage if I just had that guy's wife. If I could just have a wife like her, I would finally be a happy man. If I could just have that lifestyle, if I could just get that job, if I could just get that promotion, I would be respected if I held that person's position. If I could get a hold of that, if I could get a bite of that, if I could just get a little bit of this in my life, that degree, we would sell out our convictions, we'll throw out our morals, but the worst thing is we turn our back on God. That person or thing or accomplishments takes over all of our time in life. Coveting is dangerous. It grows secretly in our hearts. We can sit in church every Sunday morning and be coveting, and nobody knows it. It leads to sin. It defiles, it defiles and divides our communities, and it separates us from our God. This is the danger of the sin, which leads then to this, and I think it's critical we talk about this. What's the cure for it? You shall not covet. Not your neighbor's house, not his wife, not his male or female servant, not his ox or donkey. You shall not covet. Like I said earlier, this word is different than all the others because this one deals with my heart. And it makes it different, and that makes it different because it is the one that is almost, it feels impossible for us to keep this command. I mean, sometimes I have a picture of if God were to give us a pop quiz on the 10. You know how you used to get in school? Just show up one day at church and, and Jesus were here and say, okay, we're going to quiz you on the 10. <laughs> See how you're doing this week. Most of us, I hope, would you know, at least get 6 out of 10. I'm looking at some of you, three out of ten, maybe. <laughs> and so what if God were to give us a pop quiz? Um, I'm, okay, I'm, I think I'm pretty good. I'm not bowing down to idols, check. I keep the Sabbath, I'm here, check. I don't steal. I didn't sleep around. I haven't killed anyone, wanted to, didn't do it, check, check, check. <laughs> and then we get to number ten. And God says, don't even think about it. And if you don't get this one right, you get a big fat F on the whole quiz. None of us passes the test. Now that sounds humorous, but what did Jesus say? You have heard that it has been said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say unto you, if you can look on a woman and lust after her in your heart, you have committed the sin. Wow. We're all in big trouble, aren't we? This one stops all of our self-righteousness dead in its tracks. We all break this command. Even the Apostle Paul. I mean, you couldn't keep the law better than the Apostle Paul. He said, I was a Pharisee from my youth. When it came to the matters of the law, I was spotless in keeping the outward uh, matters of the law. But look what he says in Romans chapter 7, verse 7. He says, um, roll that up there for me. Oh, there, there we go. I would not have known what sin was. Well, why? Because he was a self-righteous Pharisee. He was keeping all of the outward commandments. I would have not known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would not have known... Why does he pick this one out? I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, you shall not covet. It was this command. This expert in the law. He said in regard to righteousness that he could be gained by the law, I was faultless. 
I, I played this game. I, I ran down the list of the law. I did not do all of these things. I observed all of the outward commands. None of them brought me under conviction until I came to this one. You shall not covet. And then he realized he had no place to hide because he's dealing with a God who judges the thoughts and the intents of our hearts. He's dealing with a God who knows these things. And maybe sometimes, maybe even most of the time, we church people do pretty good through sheer willpower and self-righteousness. We can grit our teeth and keep from lying. And most of us don't steal that much. And we don't harm other people. But that part of me that wants to, that part of me that lusts, that part of me that hates, that part of me that envies, I can't get that part under control. I can't get that one cleaned up. And as we've learned, if that part of me is messed up, eventually I will do something that messes me up outwardly. That's why you see church people fall away all of the time. Because they thought they could just show up and carry the right Bible and follow the right rules and belong to the right denomination and keep everything that way. They thought that that was going to make their life work, but they didn't deal with what life is all about. And if you don't get this under control, someday it's going to mess you up. And so we slander, we destroy our marriage. Christian people who have been with the same person for 20 some odd years and all of a sudden do something crazy and we all walk around shaking our hands like how did that happen? Well it just keeps happening it's not a mystery is it? There's something wrong with our hearts. So what can we do about this? How do we conquer this one? Folks it always starts at the cross. It always starts at the foot of the cross. Paul says Here's what I've learned. The law is a schoolmaster meant to bring me to Jesus. If I really read the law the way I'm supposed to read it, it doesn't make me feel confident. It makes me feel convicted. If I really understand the law, it's not a checklist that I have to go through every Sunday to pass the test. What the law makes me aware of is not that I qualify, but that I'm unqualified. And I need help. And I need grace. And I need mercy. The law is a schoolmaster that brings me to Christ, especially this one. It makes it very clear to any thoughtful soul that we don't have any hope apart from Jesus. We need his blood. We need his forgiveness. We need his cleansing. We need his Holy Spirit. We need him to change this part of us that we can't control. We, need to be, we don't need to be standing on our feet saying, See, Lord, how good I am, how I've kept the law. We need to be on our knees saying, Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a right spirit within me. Don't cast me away from your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. If it had not been for you, Lord, on my side, where would I be? Because I'm a sinner, and apart from you, I have no good thing. This is what the law does. And the cross of Jesus is the cure. This is why Jesus had to come and die. If the law could have made us perfect, then he died in vain. That's what the scripture says. And so Christ came here to shed his blood so that we could be cleansed from the inside out. The cross is the cure. I would add, if you've come to the cross, then you need to learn contentment. Here's what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 13. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he said, I will never leave you and I'll never forsake you. Love of money is just another form of coveting. And the, he and the book of Hebrews says, keep your life free from this. In other words, you've got to remain alert to the very, um, and, and very intentional about uh, keeping your life free from any hint of this. You've got to be honest with yourself about this stuff. And the way we do that is being content with what we have. Contentment is the antibody to greed. Con and it's better than any vaccine that's out there, right? Contentment is the antibody to the disease of greed. And, and, and But again, this doesn't come naturally to the, us. Paul says, I've had to learn to be content. Well, how do I do that? Contentment is a condition we learn and develop. And, and it's not mechanistic. I don't think I can give you some three-step formula that's going to produce contentment in your life. But I can tell you some things that you could do that would create space in your heart for you to be a more content person. Here's one. Start celebrating God's blessings on other people. 
When you see God bless somebody else with a nice house or a promotion, or you see someone with a great wife or a husband, instead of coveting, celebrate that God has been good to that person. Don't question, don't envy, don't compare, don't pout. Replace the envious words that you say in your heart with words of celebration. Well, good for them. I'm glad to hear that their business is prospering. Thank God for the gift that you gave them. Lord, help them to enjoy it. Help them to enjoy that new house. Lord, thank you for, um, for raising him up to that position. Give him wisdom and success. Help his business to prosper so it'll bless our community. Start, it, it may feel fake at first. You probably will be faking it when you first start, right? But it may feel fake at worst, but I think it becomes more and more a part of you and you become comfortable with it. Start speaking celebration instead of covetousness in your heart. Here's another one. Start saying thank you for everything you already have. Even better than celebrating what others have, speak words of gratitude for what you have. Let's all try it. Let's all try it together this morning. God, thank you for my husband. Ladies, God, let's do this together. I know it's hard. You probably fought on the way to church. He said something stupid. Happens to all of you. Okay, I'm going to let you off the hook. Guys, you can't get out of this, guys. God, thank you for my wife. Oh, people, we need to pray. (laughs) But I really want you to try this. Father, thank you for my husband. Thank you. Thank you that he shuts the lights off. You've given him a detailed mind. That's good. It's saving us money on our electric bill. Thank you, Father. Thank you for my wife. Thank you for my house. My house isn't on a lake, but it isn't in a lake either. Thank you for that, Father. (laughs) Lord, thank you. I I, I live in Florida. Thank you, God. I wake up to sunshine 70% of the days in the state I'm living in. I love Florida. Thank you, God, for letting me live in the state of Florida. (laughs) You ought to thank God for the country you're living in. You, You ought to thank God that you're being raised in the United States of America. Sometimes I feel like we're being taught to despise a despise a a, a country that's been so blessed. And I think that you ought to just you ought to get up every day and say, Thank God I'm living in a country that the rest of the world is dying to get into. By the way, you ought to thank God this way. You promised that you would never leave me or forsake me. And he has always kept that promise, hasn't he? Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget even one of his benefits. Not even one. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Don't forget one of his benefits, folks. He's opened up the windows of heaven and poured out blessing on us. He's been good to us. Here's another one. Get involved in blessing somebody else. Get a bigger purpose in your life. Replace that terrible, relentless, gnawing desire to get something you don't have with an intentional plan to give something away. Make it your goal this week. This week! This week! Make it your goal to help one person eat better or read better or do their job better or just feel better. If, if you went out the door every morning this week with one simple prayer, Lord, help me to spot at least one opportunity this week to encourage somebody or to serve somebody or to give something to somebody. Gradually, you'd stop looking at what people have that you can get, and instead you'd start looking at what they need that you can give. You can do this. If you're a blood-washed, spirit-filled believer, you have treasure in this earthen vessel that you're walking around in that the world needs. You can be a minister of hope and life, not, not this silly, shallow, positive thinking that they have to hype their, their self up with. You can bring real life and hope to other people who are looking for it. It's not whether we say yes or no to our desires, but always what we do with our desires. And Christianity recognizes that we have desire that's going mad inside of us, but it doesn't seek to rectify the problem by killing our desires. It solves the problem by healing our desires. And one more time, folks, I have to tell you that the healing and the hope for you and for us and for our world begins at the foot of the cross. It begins with Jesus. 
because he's the only one that can change your heart. Why don't you all bow your heads with me? I had a feeling when I came here this morning that some of you have been wrestling with misplaced desires. I mean, like we've said, it's always a problem, but it's been a real problem in your life this week. Or it's just been a rough month. We've been prone to look on the negatives and focus on the things that wear us down and wear us out. And today, you just need to realize that you have the treasure of the Holy Spirit inside of you and you have something to give that the world desperately needs. And some of you walked in this place this morning and you don't know Jesus. And you may have been coming for church your whole life, but you've never had your heart cleansed. You've never had your sins forgiven. You've never been to the cross and asked Him for salvation. Every Sunday is an opportunity. Well, every moment's an opportunity, but this moment where we close and worship and we open these altars, this could be an eternally life changing moment for you right now. Your life could be different, your marriage could begin to change your eternity could be secure. And so I don't want to rush past this. In just a minute after I say amen, we're going to have you stand and sing, and some of you need to do business with God. And so these altars are here for you, and there are people that would meet you here. And if you're feeling the Spirit of God move you, then I pray that you not not um, take that lightly, not be disobedient, but respond. Father, we pray in Christ's name that in this holy moment, this is a holy moment. Eternity is hanging in the balance right now. Marriages are hanging in the balance right now. Somebody is, has been playing around with the temptation and they've already got the phone number and this week they could make the call that destroys everything that's good in their life. Some of us have got runaway desires that have led us into alcoholism and addiction and it's slowly growing and it's going to destroy everything and you're standing here as the giver of life, offering us an opportunity and saying, whosoever will, let him come. Let him come unto me. And I'm praying, God, that in this moment, your spirit would not let us run away from you again. Pull us towards yourself. And I pray for the soul that needs to do real business with you, that they'll come and they'll find you. And their lives will be changed. Teach us how to be grateful people. And Lord, help us to walk in the anointing that you've given us to be people that bless the people around us. In your name and for your glory, we ask it. Amen.